Hi, I'm Pamela Fagan Hutchins, and you found Wine, Women, and Writing Radio. We are part of the Authors on the Air Global Network, so we are solely owned and copyrighted. And I am excited today to have a real woman who kicks ass, writes books, has a fascinating background, and we're going to talk about some of her fiction and, as usual, um, the super authentic, complex female characters and the real life experiences they're based upon and how that translates into great fiction. Um, I, I should also pull out the half drink bottle of wine under the table. <laughs> or maybe it's a wine, You're women and writing. Me. We're just going to go ahead and here, pass the bottle. Um, but uh, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. So maybe we won't invibe yet. Not just yet. Not just yet. Christina, welcome. Wow. Thank you for having me, Pam. It's a lot of fun. I, um, I think we figured out here at Wild Deadwood Reads in South Dakota, where we ran into each other last night, I think we figured out after a you look familiar moment that we met nearly a year ago in Nashville. Of all places. And now we're in, yes, South Dakota. Of, of all places. places. <laughs> Neither of us have any ties to Nashville Either place. or South Dakota, but here yeah. we are. And I think it's going to keep happening as I... I think so. Listen to our lineup yes. of conferences. But um, Christina and I actually were at the same table in Nashville selling our books. And she first jumped out at me because I hadn't heard of her yet before. But her, one of her books was up for the Silver Falchion um, Award for Suspense, I suspense believe. Once, suspense. Yes. And it's a terrific honor, especially for somebody that's um, just had two two novels published mm -hmm. at this point under under this suspense thriller um, world. So I was impressed. I was like, she's got creds. So tell us about that. Tell us about you and and what your journey and what brought you to writing this these fabulous books. Well, long story, um, oh, good. but it started when I was five years old. I won a little prize in whatever kindergarten, first grade for writing interesting stories. So I guess it's something that's always been there. I just always wanted to write. I, I loved to read. I just read voraciously and that made me want to write books, novels. And um, in high school, I was in writers workshops. I was in the, on the school newspaper. I discovered journalism and I knew that was what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a journalist. So that's what I became, which was a journalist uh, for newspapers, which are now kind of, you know, almost like a vintage uh, era. <laughs> but you were on the tail end, <laughs> right? That was just like yes. almost yesterday. <laughs> yeah, almost yesterday. It's a sad, sad to say, I'm very sad to see. But um, so I became a newspaper reporter and that um, for 30 years, that's what I did. I was a foreign correspondent in oh, South fine. America for um, almost 10 years and worked for the Miami Herald, the Associated Press. And I loved every minute of it. I really, really did. Talk about um, finding interesting stories. I mean, to have that be your profession where it's your job to go out and and seek them out and touch them and feel them and bring them back and make them real for everyone oh, that's else. What I, yeah, that's what I loved about it. I mean, I say, you know, I interviewed everyone from, from bums to billionaires, prostitutes to presidents. And, it's, and it was just true every day, you know, I was just out learning a whole new thing, oh. um, whether it was an industry or about someone or just social issues. I covered so many You've given social me goosebumps. issues and just, <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was just fascinating all the time. And sometimes dangerous. Occasionally, yes. Occasionally, <laughs> I got into uh, situations that uh, I kind of woke up and I said, oh, I shouldn't really be here. And, Sanctioned um, by the newspaper? Or were they trying to say, keep it to a dull roar, Christina? Yeah, I, we don't have to come <laughs> fish you out of Bolivia. Or <laughs> No, yeah. One of the one time I was in, um, I had to pose as a nun to get into a jail in Caracas, Venezuela. Um, nice. Because the... Um, the Ministry of Prisons wouldn't let me in. They quickly said, we cannot assure your safety in this jail. It was known for, you know, horrendous human rights violations. And I was doing a story for Human Rights Magazine. So I met this nun, Filipina nun, and um, we, didn't dress in, we didn't dress in a habit or anything, but I went with her just as an American nun. And although I hated doing that, you're not supposed to lie that about, you know, your identity, who you are and what you're doing. It was the only way I was going to get in and firsthand see the conditions and stuff. Right. So it was it was a pretty 
So they would respect a nun a little bit more than your average. Yes. You weren't guaranteed <laughs> safety, but maybe a little better as a nun. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because I, and I asked a lot of questions. And so some of the inmates were like, are you a reporter? Are you a periodista? <laughs> no, like, no, 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 you know, I don't I'm just really. interested. I'm just, you know, just <laughs> gathering information. And the <laughs> Hail Marys yeah, and go acts of contrition. Yeah, you know, they would show me the shanks, you know, this long from a, oh you know. Oh my gosh. They would, um, what do you call, file a bed leg, nice. you know, and put down the, the side, back of their pants. And then they wanted to show me the wastewater things. We go down in this basement and there's this broken pipe and all this black agua negra, you know, flowing out. And, um, <sighs> And all of a sudden, I thought, mm, I shouldn't be here. I'm just alone with these two guys. That could I think, just, I could disappear forever. Yeah, I'm into got that. This big shame. I'm like, let me just, <laughs> oh, let's go back upstairs. I it's said. the shank or the wastewater. Which way do you want to yeah. go? Up and yes, out. Up and out. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, so from there, what made you give up the thrill of the hunt for the for the great story? Or, or, or did you ever really give that up to move into? writing in a different way, writing for, um, between the covers of books. Well, I love, um, I've always loved fiction and that was really what I wanted to, to do. I, my whole life was to write a, a novel and, um, I've written short stories on and off, you know, while I was doing journalism. Um, and then about, I don't know, 2000, Two, no, 2004, 2005, I really just got, for some reason I stopped, I had re rehabbed a house in Miami and um, I just said, oh, I'm going to write a book. So I just started writing and I would get up about five o'clock every morning and um, before I got my son up for school and just start writing. And of course, that's the no proverbial novel in the drawer that still hasn't <laughs> seen light of day. But um, but I did it, you know, and I finished a, a novel. It took several attempts to try and get out of the journalistic um sort of style and voice to get into fiction. And it's something I've had to work on to do that. That must um, have been very ingrained, useful yes. in some ways. Extremely. I mean, you know, totally a, a sync with uh, many skills you need as a, as a fiction writer. But the big thing that's missing in journalism, you cannot be emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to tell the story right down the middle. You have to tell both sides. You know, you don't use a lot of description and, you know, I, I tried to, you know, always get as much stuff as I could in, in my feature writing and whatnot. But, you know, you can use fairly minimal adjectives and description and that kind of thing. Um, but so I had to kind of weed that out of my writing. Yeah, and the <clears throat> never taking a side or being biased, right. but uh, which is the antithesis of a protagonist right. in writing in a right. voice. So, um, but you you seem to have worked those things um, out and emerged on the other side with some pretty good yes. stuff. As much as I love journalism, making stuff up is a lot more fun. Isn't it, it really is. You don't have to stick to the truth. I feel it's so freeing. It is totally, <laughs> totally freeing. liberating. And you can <clears throat> start with whatever that interesting story is that yes. you discuss discovered. Um, so the the areas that you've gone into with fiction, I mean, I was most drawn to a girl on the brink just because of my fascination with with um, female relationships and protagonists. Although I when I met Christina, the, the novel that was up for the award features a male protagonist and it's um, skin, of skin of tattoos. I would say tattoos on the skin, but that's a bad title and obviously not the title of your book, Skin of Tattoos. So, which also has some wonderful mm -hmm. um, uh, female characters in it and um, plot pivotal female characters. But I was really drawn to you know the the plight of this um, this teenage girl and in what is essentially how would you describe genre for girl? On the um, it's a young adult novel. The, the protagonist is Chloe. She's seventeen, a high school senior, and um, it's what you call a contemporary social issue book in, in YA genres. Mm -hmm. um, it deals with dating violence and abusive oh, relationships. Yes. It's loosely uh, sort of inspired on something that I went through. And um, after going through this earthquake in my life, I just felt really strong. I wanted to write about it as a sort of a cautionary tale to um, teenage girls who were starting their dating lives about sort of the red flags of an abusive relationship and what they are, because they can be very mi easily misinterpreted. And um, if you don't know what they are, nobody tells you what they are. That's the whole thing is nobody really tells you or alerts you. So they can be very easily mistaken. So that's what I wrote. And young girls are so, I find, I have three daughters. And so they're in love with being in love. Yes. And in that, that discovery of that feeling. So it's, it's easy to trick them. Um, 
the warning signs to them sometimes don't look like warning signs at all. There's something romantic. Or yes, it's a beautiful. whirlwind, you know, and they tend mm -hmm. to, what abusive relationships start out as a whirlwind romance. Mm -hmm. The guy comes on very strong, very heavy, very, you know, uh, insistent and, you know, it can bowl you over. It does bowl you over. I mean, and not even just young girls, I mean, adult women. And, That's true. Um, you just get bowled over by it. Well, I'm sorry that you went through that, but how wonderful for young girls and for all of us that you were able to take that and and create this book with it. Um, so, you know, to the extent you're comfortable, um, weave it together for us a little bit about how what you went through became Chloe or how much of you is in Chloe. Um, um, well, Chloe's a, an aspiring newspaper reporter, so well, she's a journalist. There's a little, there's a little Christina there. <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. So she uses that skill actually to kind of defeat um, Kieran as the guy. Mm -hmm. And um, I set it in my in a fictional town in New Jersey where I went to high school, and um, called Indian Valley. And she meets this guy as she's uh, being an, a, as a summer intern um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on a local newspaper. And so she, he, she's on an interview and she meets him. And that's how I met my abuser too, was on an interview kind of through a, a he called the newsroom on a story kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, in Miami. So, um, so then I just had to, you know, took it from there and I include, even dialogue is actually the same that, you know, things he would say to me. Seared I used, in your memory. But I had to use, you know, totally a different plot, but, but there are definitely similarities. And again, she, and in the end, she, or I'm not, she uses her newspaper skills, uh, news uh, reporter skills to kind of defeat his moves against her without so, giving away too much of the plot. But so even though she is um, of her age, she's a young girl, not yet mature, doesn't recognize the signs. By the end of the book, she's a strong character. She's, yes. she's freeing herself. Yes, what I learned by going through all that, and and you know, when you go through something like that, and you emerge from the other side, you emerge just much that much stronger, and um, so it was a real uh, eye-opening experience for me. It just you know, you go walk through the ring of fire, and you come out the other side, mm -hmm. and just that much more stronger, and you know, willing. You know, you can. I feel I can sort of take on anything at this point. I got through that. The rest of life is a piece of cake. <laughs> it, from just the, what I know of you, I believe that you've embodied that as you've tackled all these things that you do. Um, you teach writing and you mentor writing with some, uh, I want to say, some elements of our population that most people don't come into contact with every day. Well, this is true. <laughs> so that takes guts and compassion. It's a, it's yeah. a beautiful combination. So with um, with that, I'll let you tell everybody what that is. Um, I go uh, into a prison. It's a maximum security prison in Los Angeles County. Um, and I, I sort of mentor, really, I, I'm creative writing inmates. Uh, most of them are lifers uh, doing life uh, for murder and other very long, very heavy sentences. Um, and, um, it's been a, it's just a wonderful experience. I, it's, it's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done personally. It wow. really is. And, and they are so appreciative of anyone coming in from the outside. Many of them don't get visits or anything like that. Um, so they're just so appreciative and so grateful of someone coming in to spend time with them. They're very keenly aware that they have sort of been banished from society. And they have stories needing to get out, sometimes yes. therapeutically, I would imagine, but but also really amazing stories. Yeah, I mean, they, they are. They're pretty heart-rending stories from their backgrounds. Um, so I tell them, you know, write your truth. Um, and that's what they do. So, you know, poems, um, story, you know, essays, that kind of thing. And um, and I do think it's it's been very therapeutic and it's been very rewarding to see them most of them are not even high school graduates. So uh, to see their progress too, it's just been amazing. And at least I'm a, of a believer, um, you know, may I be stricken down by everyone that has an MFA in literature, but I'm a believer that a good storyteller is a good storyteller. If you've got a story to tell, you can learn to get it out. And sometimes the authenticity comes from, limitations is the wrong word, but, the background of the writer and the background of the storyteller, which doesn't have to be um, multi-degreed to have uh, heart um, mm -hmm. and, and to, to really reach people. In fact, for other people that have walked in the same shoes as the people that you're working for, 
they probably wouldn't want to read a book by me. They'd probably a lot rather read anything written by somebody who's walked in their shoes. Yeah, I mean, we all want to see ourselves in, you know, reflected in pages of literature mm -hmm. or or even, you know, newspaper or what have you. We all want to be, see ourselves, our own stories uh, and lives reflected. So they really, um, I, and I try and give them readings to that effect as well, mm -hmm. um, things that they can read that relate to their lives. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, that's really what it's about is finding just ways to tell their stories and giving voice to their stories, which is very underserved yeah. um, part of the population. And, and I also remember just from a conversation that we were having last night in the bar um, that you take your skills in a totally different direction and work with people that are writing dissertations, that you do a lot of coaching with um, candidates for degrees who are putting together papers. So a totally different type of writing. We've got journalism, we've got creative writing in the prisons, we've got your novels and your nonfiction, and we've got you coaching dissertation candidates. You're, you're just, in your head and well <laughs> it's all it's all about writing yeah, you know and that's my passion and that's what i've always done and um and i do have to eat so and i don't yes. <laughs> this is the thing starving but, artist yes, yes <laughs> writing novels so for you know to make a living and to actually eat uh, you know i do editing of dissertations uh, i do public relations writing i write corporate yeah. speeches press releases all that kind of stuff no writing is ever wasted though every word that we it all write. goes into the mix. Goes it really does. It. It's all feeds into this sort of grinder in the in the brain, and it and it comes out. So, um, with your um, girl on the brink, the we talked about the relationship that she had with her abuser. Um, because we just started discussing this interview, uh, I was picking it up and reading the beginning last night, but I did have to sleep. So. Are there other female relationships in the book that you feel strongly influenced Chloe on her journey, or was she just being too dominated by this? Uh, well, Kieran? the one thing is, is in the background that sort of makes her vulnerable to Kieran is that her parents have split up, mm. and so her mother has kind of checked out into a fog of of pills and. Um, and she's sort of left, Chloe is sort of left taking care of her mother and she's very worried about her mother yeah. um, because her mother's taking, you know, prescription pills and just kind of depressed. Um, so that's, and that's a, a, another a arc, relationship mm -hmm. arc in the story. And then of course the editor of the newspaper she's working for, Marion, is, um, is her coach, you know, her, her journalism coach that right. teaches her these skills and, and encourages her and really supports her, her career aspirations. I'm thinking of my 21 year old daughter who <clears throat> dated an abuser in uh, high school. If you're watching this, honey, I'm sorry I didn't use your name. And, um, and you know, rough background, et cetera, and how much I wish she'd have read a book like this because parents of girls, you know, they're not talking to you. You know that they're, that these things that they think may be a little bit wrong, they're keeping to themselves. They don't want to face you, the one who thinks they do no wrong. And to encourage them to read this kind of fiction could be something that not only they get enjoyment out of, but that could save their lives. So I highly, highly encourage you moms of teenage girls to check out Girl on the Brink by Christina Ho, which you can buy everywhere um, um, Amazon and the usual stuff, Barnes and Noble, that's right. dot com, and it just released on audio too. If you like on, demand on good books, demand your library and your bookstores provide this to you. If you um, are not someone that likes to shop online, now I like to shop online, and, and in fact, I'm probably going to download on audio because that's my preferred method of reading. So, um, where can readers find? Christina Hogue and her books? Um, well, my website well, is christinahogue.com yeah. mm -hmm. and you can send an email to me through that. And, um, you know, I speak at different conferences, book clubs, writing groups, all that kind of thing. Um, so you do not often. have to be in prison to get No, you do not have <laughs> to be in prison. This is good. <laughs> it is very good. <laughs> <laughs> We're not advocating that. Don't don't get yourself thrown in the pokey so that you can work with Christina. You can come to workshops and you can come to these different venues that you can find on our website. Mm -hmm. And now what are you working on now? What's 
Uh, it's gonna. It's another young adult novel, and this is gonna be about. It's called Truth, and it's gonna be about the telling the truth. Uh, is is telling the truth always the right thing to do? And the price the price you pay for telling the truth. Nice. And there's a crime at the center of it, but it's not. It's not a who done it, but there is a crime. And um, another. It's gonna be another teenage girl protagonist grappling with this issue and what this telling the truth is going to cost her. Influenced by a lifetime of. Uh, teetering on the edge of who's telling you the truth and not in journalism. Yeah, it's kind of it's, it's a very interesting um, subject. Actually, I used to cover courts in Patterson, New Jersey, and as I was sitting in the courtroom one day covering some trial, probably a, a murder, I think it was. It was just a sort of a garden variety stabbing murder, and nothing too sensational. But you know, yeah, garden variety. That for Christina, that's garden variety. For the rest of us, that's like ooh. <laughs> and, um, but a parade of witnesses came on and they all saw something different. And it all came down to very, like, a few seconds when the stabbing occurred. And it was amazing how many people saw something different and witnessed something different, remembered something different. And I sat there kind of remembering, you know, thinking, what is the truth? Is there is truth an absolute or is it a subjective thing like beauty? Um, so it's, it's an interesting question. You know, we all remember things and, and where where truth lies. Right. And then have our own, you know, reasons and perspectives for either why we filtered it differently or why we can't face it exactly. or tell it. Yes. So I think that sounds fascinating. And so for those of you that want to follow her journey and see where, uh, when that comes out, how to pick it up, she's giving you her website. She's out there doing it every single day. Talk about kicking ass. Um, I just, I'm really impressed. I'm so glad that we've run into each other again and that you agreed to be on the show. And next time we'll do it where we can open the bottle of wine while we talk. <laughs> yes, that'll be really interesting. Note to self, schedule interviews after five. Yes. So, um, and until next time, I'm Pamela Fagan Hutchins. This is Wine, Women, and Writing Radio, where we talk about great female characters and the real life experiences that they're based on. And you guys read some good books. We'll see you next time. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming.